Chapter Four: The Land of Ahu Ahu. I might attempt to set down a matter-of-fact description of this place if only the subject permitted one to be matter-of-fact, strange and remote, set in a lonely space of the sea and isolated from the world for the seven or eight centuries following the decline of Polynesian navigation. There is no other land like this hollow island of Ahu Ahu. Week after week, month after month, the watcher on its cliffs may gaze out towards the horizon and never see a sail nor a distant trail of smoke to liven the dark blue desert of the Pacific. The cliffs themselves are strange. The reef of an ancient atoll, uprised in some convulsion of the earth to form a ring of coral limestone, sheer precipice facing the sea, half a mile of level barren summit, and an inner wall of cliffs overlooking the rich lowlands of the interior. During the unnumbered years of their occupation, this land has set a stamp upon its people, so long on Ahu Ahu that they have forgotten whence they came. Hardy, hospitable, and turbulent, they are true children of the islands, and yet a family apart, ruder, and less languid than the people of Samoa, or Tahiti, and speaking a harsher tongue and more than any other island folk they live in the past for ghosts walk on ahu ahu and the living commune nightly with the old dead who lie in the moiri it was an hour before sunset when we sighted the land the merest blue irregularity on the horizon visible from one's perch in the shrouds each time the schooner rose to the crest of a sea the mellow shout of landfall brought a score of native passengers to their feet. At such a moment one realizes the passionate devotion of the islander to his land. Men sprang into the rigging to gaze ahead with eager exclamations. Mothers held up their babies, born on distant plantations, for a first glimpse of Ahu Ahu. Seasick old women, emerging from disordered heaps of matting, tottered to the bulwarks with eyes alight. The island had not been visited for six months, and we carried a cargo of extraordinary variety, hardware, bolts of calico, soap, lumber, jewelry, iron roofing, cement, groceries, phonograph records, an unfortunate horse, and several pigs, those inevitable deck passengers in the island trade. There were scores of cases of bully beef and ship's biscuit, and staple luxuries of modern Polynesia, and, most important of all, six heavy bags of mail. As we drew near the island toward midnight, I gave up the attempt to sleep in my berth and went on deck to spread a mat besides Tari, our supercargo, who lay aft of the mainmast, talking in low tones with his wife. It was calm here in the lee of the island. The schooner slipped through the water with scarcely a sound, rising and falling, on the long gentle swell, Faint puffs of air came off the land, bringing a scent of flowers and wood smoke and moist earth. We had been sighted, for lights were beginning to appear in the village. Now and then, on a flow of the breeze, one heard a sigh, long drawn and half inaudible, the voice of the reef. A party of natives, seated on the forward hatch, began to sing. The words were modern and religious, I believe, but the music, indescribably sad, wild and stirring, carried one back through the centuries to the days when man expressed the dim yearnings of his spirit in communal song. It was a species of chant with responses. Four girls did most of the singing, their voices mingling in barbaric harmonies, each verse ending in a prolonged melodious wail. Precisely as the last note died away in time with the cadence of the chant, the deep voices of the men took up the response. Kare Aure, no, alas. Terry turned to me. They sing well, he said, those Ahu Ahu people. I like to listen to them. That is a hymn, but a stranger would never suspect it. The music is pure heathen. Look at the torchlights in the village. Smell the land breeze. It would tell you you were in the islands if you were set down here blindfolded from a place ten thousand miles away. With that singing in one's ears, it is not difficult to fancy oneself in a long canoe 
at the end of a one-time voyage, chanting a song of thanksgiving to the gods who have brought us safely home. He is by no means the traditional supercargo of a trading schooner. This, Terry, I have wasted a good deal of time speculating as to his origin and the reasons for his choosing this mode of life. An Englishman, with a hint of Oxford in his voice, quite obviously what we call a gentleman, a reader of reviews, the possessor, at his charming place in Nukatari, of an enviable collection of books on the natural history and ethnology of the South Seas. He seldom speaks of himself or of his people at home. For twenty years he has been known in this part of the world, trading on Perin, Rakatanga, Tupai, the atolls of the Palamutu. He speaks a dozen of the island dialects, can join in the singing of the Yudis, or bring a roar of applause by his skill in the dances of widely separated groups. When the war broke out, he enlisted as a private in a New Zealand battalion, and the close of hostilities found him with decorations for gallantry, the rank of captain, and the scars of honorable wounds. As a subject for conversation, the war interests him as little as his own life, but this evening he had emptied a full bottle of rum, and was in the mildly mellow state which is his nearest approach to intoxication. "'I never thought I'd see the old country again,' he said. "'But the war changed all that. I got a nasty wound in Gallipoli, you see, and they sent me home to convalesce. The family wasn't meant to know I was hurt, but they saw a bit of a thing in the paper an account of the exploit which won Terry his DCM, and there they were at the dock when the transport offloaded. I hadn't laid eyes on them for fifteen years. The old governor, by Jove, he was decent. It was all arranged that I should stop in England when the war was over. I thought myself it was a go when the job was finished, and I'd get a special dispensation to be demobbed at home. I stood it for a fortnight, and then gave up. Home is all very well for a week or two, but for a steady thing, I seem to fit better down here. What is it that makes a chap stop in the islands? You must have felt it yourself, and yet it is hard to put into words. This sort of thing, perhaps, he swept his hand through the soft darkness, the beauty, the sense of remoteness, the vague and agreeable melancholy of these places, then I, like the way the years slipped past, the pleasant monotony of life, my friends at home put up with a kind of dullness which would drive me mad. But here, where there is even less to distinguish one day from another, one seems never to grow fretful or impatient of time. One's horizon narrows, of course. I scarcely look at the newspaper any more. If you stop here, you will find yourself unconsciously drifting into the native state of mind readjusting your sense of values until the great events of the world seem far off and unreal, and your interests are limited to your own business, the vital statistics of your island, and the odd kinds of human nature about you. Perhaps this is the way we are meant to live. At any rate, it brings serenity. I've been here too long to sentimentalize about the natives. They have their weak points, and plenty of them. Allowing for these, you'll find that the Kanakas are a good sort to have about, often amusing, always interesting, at once deep, artful, gay, simple, and childish. At bottom, they are not very different from ourselves. It is chiefly a matter of environment. Consider any of the traders who came here as boys, old fellows who will buttonhole you and spend hours abusing the people. The truth is that they have become more native than the men they abuse. There are places like Africa, where one can live among a primitive people and absorb nothing from them. Their point of view is too alien, their position in the scale of humanity too widely separated from our own. It is different in the islands. If one could discover the truth, it wouldn't surprise me to learn that these people were distant cousins of ours. The scholars, in whose conclusions I have much faith, trace them back along the paths of successive migrations through Indonesia to northern India, or the land of the Kushites. In any case, I believe that the blood we term Caucasian flows in their veins. The legacies of ancestors separated from the parent stocks so long ago that mankind had not yet learned the use of iron, 
and they are old, these island tribes, who were discovering new lands in the Pacific in the days when our forefathers wore the horns or bulls upon their heads. Don't judge them in the present, or even in the time of Cook. They were a dying people then, whose decline had begun five or six hundred years before. It seems to me that a race, like an individual, grows old, loses heart, and fades away. On nearly every island, they are dying today, a tragedy, an inevitable one, which the coming of the European has hastened, but not caused. Whether or not it may be accounted for on grounds of a distant kinship, it is impossible to stop long in the islands without absorbing, to a certain extent, the native point of view. Things which seem rubbish at first slowly acquire significance. One begins to wonder if, after all, there may not be varieties of knowledge lost to us in the complexities of civilization. I've seen some queer things myself. My wife's mother lives on Ahu Ahu, where her ancestors have been hereditary rulers since Maui fished the island out of the sea. I've known the family a good many years, and long before I married Apakura, the old lady was kind enough to take a motherly interest in me. I always put up with her when we touched at Ahu Ahu. Once, after I had been away for several months, I sat down to have a yarn with her, and was beginning to tell about where I'd been and what I'd done, when she stopped me. No, let me tell you, she said, with an odd smile, and upon my honor, she did, down to the details. I got the secret out of her the same evening. She is very friendly, it seems, with an ancestor of hers, a woman named Rakamona who lived twenty-eight generations, seven hundred years ago, and is buried in the big mare behind the village. When one of the family is off on a trip, and my mother-in-law suspects that he is in trouble, or not behaving himself, she puts herself into a kind of trance, calls up old Rakamona, and gets all the facts. I hope the habit won't come into general use. Might prove jolly awkward, eh? Seriously, though, I can't account for the thing she told me without accepting her own explanation. Strange, if there were a germ of truth in the legend, of how the old sea-going canoes were navigated, the priests in a state of trance directing the helmsman which way to steer for land. There's another old woman on Ahu Ahu, whose yarns are worth hearing. Many years ago a Yankee whaling vessel called at the island and a Portuguese harpooner who had had trouble with the captain, deserted, and hid himself in the bush. The people had taken a fancy to him and refused to give him up, so finally the captain was obliged to sail away without his man. From all accounts, this harpooner must have been a good chap, when he proved that he was no common white waster. The chief gave him a bit of land, and a girl of good family for a wife. Now the old lady of whom I spoke. I think it was tools he needed, or some sort of gear for a house he was building. At any rate, when another whaler touched, he told his wife that he was going on a voyage to earn some money, and that he might be gone a year. There was a kind of agreement current in the Pacific in those days, whereby a whaling captain promised to land a man at the point where he had signed him on. Well, the harpooner sailed away, and, as might have been expected, his wife never saw him again. But here comes the odd part of the story. The deserted wife, like so many of the Ahu Ahu women, had an ancestor who kept her in touch with current events. Being particularly fond of her husband, she indulged in a trance from time to time to keep herself informed of his welfare. Several months after his departure, the tragedy occurred, described in detail by the obliging and sympathetic dweller in the Mare. It was a kind of vision, as told to me, singularly vivid for an effort of pure imagination. The open Pacific, heaving gently, ruffled by a light air. Two boats from rival vessels, pursuing the same whale, the Portuguese harpooners standing in the bows of one, erect and intent upon the chase, his iron the first by a second of time to strike. Then came a glimpse of the two boats, foaming side by side in the wake of the whale, the beginning of the dispute, the lancing and death flurry of an old bull sperm, the rising anger of the two harpooners, as the boats rocked gently beside the floating carcass, the treacherous thrust, the long red blade of the lance standing out between the shoulders of the Portuguese, 
The woman awoke from her trance with a cry of anguish. Her husband was dead. She set up the widow's tangi. One might have thought it an excellent tale, concocted to save the face of a deserted wife, if the same vessel had not called at Ahu Ahu within a year, to bring news of the husband's death under the exact circumstances of the vision. What is one to believe? If seeing is believing, then count me a believer. For my own eyes have seen an incredible thing. It was on Ai Tuaki, in the cook group, an old chief, the descendant of a very ancient family, lay ill in the village. I had turned in early, as I'd promised, to go fishing on the reap when the tide served, an hour after midnight. You know how the spirits of the dead were believed to flee westward to Hawaiki, and how their voices might be heard at night, calling to one another in the sky as they drove past high overhead. Early in the evening, as I lay in bed, a boy came into the next room, panting with excitement. He had been to a plantation in the hills, it seemed, and as he returned after dusk, had heard the voices of a shouting multitude passing in the air above him. I was tired and paid little attention to his story, but for some reason I found it impossible to sleep. It was a hot night, very still and sultry, with something in the air that made one's nerves twitch every time a coconut frond dropped in the distance. I was still lying awake when my fishing companions came to get me, a little ahead of time, for, like me, they had been unable to sleep. We would wait on the reef, they suggested, while it was sure to be cool, until the tide was right. We were sitting on the dry coral, smoking. I had just looked at my watch, I remember. It lacked a few minutes to one o'clock. Our canoes were hauled up on one side of the Artuga Passage. The Western Pass, by the way. There was no moon. Suddenly one of the boys touched me. What is that? he exclaimed in a startled voice. I looked up. The others were rising to their feet. Two flaring lights were moving across the lagoon toward us, together and very swiftly. Nearer and nearer they came until they revealed the outlines of a canoe, larger than any built in the islands nowadays, a canoe of the old time, with a flaming torch set at prow and stern. While we stood there staring in silence, it drew abreast of us, moving with the rush of a swift motorboat, and passed on out to sea. I was too amazed to think clearly until I heard one of the boys whisper to another, Kuameta it aptareki. The chief is dead. The great canoe bears him out to the west. We launched our canoes and crossed the lagoon to the village. Women were wailing. Yes, the old man was dead. He had drawn his last breath a little before one o'clock. Remember that I saw this thing myself. Perhaps it was a dream. If so, we all dreamed alike. It was late. The singing died away. The lights in the village went out one by one. The passage in the Ahu Ahu Reef is a bad place by daylight. The chances were that no canoes would risk it till dawn. Terry struck a match for an instant and lay down on the mat beside his wife. In the little flare of light I saw her sleeping in the unconscious manner of a child. I know their story. A pretty one, in pleasant contrast to the usual ennoble and transitory loves of white and brown. Apakura is the daughter of the principal family of this island. Her mother and father, for many years, the warm friend of Tari. He had petted the child from the time she was three. She was always on the beach to meet the canoe that brought him ashore, and he, for his part, never forgot the small gift for which she waited with sparkling eyes. On his rambles about the island, the little girl followed Tari with the devotion of a dog, many a time clambering along the base of the cliffs at dawn. His first knowledge of her presence came with the shrill cry of, Taiki, my Tari, and he waited while his small follower managed some difficult pile of coral in the rear. Their friendship had only Tari's two or three visits a year to feed on, but neither forgot, and in the course of time, as the child learned to read and write, a correspondence began, very serious on her side, pleased and amused on his. When he went away to the war, she was eleven a slim, dark-eyed child. When he returned, she was sixteen and a woman, though he did not know it. 
On this occasion, in the evening, when the rest of the family had gone to bed, he sat talking with Apricora's mother, or, rather, listening, while the old woman told one of her stories of life on Ahu Ahu, equally fascinating and long drawn out. It is not difficult to reconstruct the scene in imagination. Tari, comfortable in bare feet, and a pombro half reclining against the wall as he smoked his pipe in absent-minded puffs. The woman, cross-legged on the floor, leaning forward in earnest speech, her voice rising, falling, and dying to a whisper in the extraordinary manner of the Polynesian teller of tales, her hands from time to time falling simultaneously with a loud slap to her knees in emphasis of some point in the narrative. The story ended, little by little, the mother led the conversation to the subject of her daughter. Terry began to praise the girl. "'What do you think of her?' asked the old woman. "'Now that you have been away these five years.' "'There is no other girl like her,' said Tari. "'Since that is so, take her with you. We shall be pleased, all of us. I, in particular, who look on you as a son. She is a good girl. She can sew, she can cook, and the young men say that she is beautiful.' "'You propose that I take her as a wife?' exclaimed the astonished Terry, to whom, in truth, the idea had not occurred. "'Yes, why not? You need a wife, now that the little affair of Tukanani has blown over.' "'But think, Mama, I am forty and the child is sixteen. It is not fitting.' "'Young wives are best if they are faithful. Apicoro will never look at another man.' "'I will think it over,' said Terry. "'Let us leave it so. Not this year, at any rate. She is too young.' As he bade her good night and turned to go to his sleeping place, the old woman spoke again. Bear one thing in mind, she said with a smile. It will help you to decide. Consider now and then the thought of my daughter married to another. In the end, as is often the case, it was Apakura who settled the matter. Next morning, Terry was busy with some stock taking and did not board the schooner till the last moment or notice in his preoccupation the mysterious smiles with which the crew greeted him they were a dozen miles offshore before he folded the last of his papers lit a pipe and went on deck for a breath of air the old woman's last words stuck unpleasantly in his mind i fancy as he stood there smoking with his back to the companionway all at once he saw the helmsman an ahu ahu boy he had known since childhood, lift his eyes from the bandicle and grin from ear to ear. At the same moment, Terry felt a hand slip into his own and heard a small, familiar voice say, I'm here. It was Apakura, more serious than usual and a little frightened, but not to be put off longer. They were married in Tahiti a fortnight later. It was Apakura's voice that awakened me. She was leaning over the bulwark in eager conversation with her mother, who had come off in the first canoe. The air was fresh with the cool dawn. In the east the sky was flushing behind scattered banks of trade-wind clouds, tinted in wonderfully delicate shades of terracotta. A dozen big outrigger canoes of the type peculiar to this island were coming out through the passage, each paddled by four men, who shouted as their heavy craft dashed through the breakers. Little by little, not at all after the manner of traditional dawn, in the tropics, the light increased until Ahu Ahu lay fully revealed before us. The smoking reef, the shallow lagoon, and the cliffs, their summits plumed with coconut palms. A crowd of islanders was already gathering on the reef, and I could see others making their way down the steep path from the settlement. As the sun rose, the colors of the scene grew stronger. Green palms, gray cliffs, white walls of the village, pale blue of the sky, azure of the sea water. There is no color in the world that I have seen like the blue of the water off the Ahu Ahu reef. So vivid, so intense, one felt that a tumbler of it held up to the sun would be a mass of sapphire, or that a handkerchief dipped in it would emerge strongly dyed. Apakura was going ashore with her mother. Standing in the narrow canoe, she directed the stowing of her luggage a mat, a bright patchwork quilt, a box of cedar wood. Terry was awaiting the coming of the traders, for the schooner was stocked with the good Tahiti rum, and the rites of welcome would take place on board. There they are, he said, pointing to two white figures, waiting gingerly across the shallow lagoon to the reef. 
you're going to meet a pair of rare ones. They've been hard doers in their time. The distant figures reached the edge of the boat passage, and I could see a boy beckoning them into a waiting canoe. But now they stopped and seemed to argue with many gestures. Terry chuckled. No use trying to hurry them, he told me. They are discussing the loss of the Esperanza. She went ashore here in the late nineties, a full rig ship. Peter was one of her crew. Charlie had just come here to trade and saw the whole thing. They've spent twenty years thrashing out the question of whether or not the wreck might have been avoided. Every morning after breakfast, Charlie strolls across to Peter's house to smoke a pipe and discuss some of the fine points. Every evening after tea, Peter returns the visit, and the argument goes on till bedtime. Charlie's an American, an old man now, close to seventy. He put in thirty years on Hiva Oa in the Marquesas before he came to Ahu Ahu. I'd like to have some of his memories. Notice his arms if he pulls his sleeves up. He has sixteen children in Hiva Ora and fourteen here, all numbered. He says he never can remember their heathen names. When his wife died in the north, he gave all his land to the children and left on the first schooner. She touched at Papiti, but he didn't go ashore. Then she made Ahuahu, where he landed and established himself a second time. He has never seen a motor car, a telephone, or an electric light. Presently the canoe came dancing alongside, and the two old men clambered painfully over the rail. Peter, thin, hatchet-faced, stooping, Charlie the ruin of a magnificent man, he towered above any of us on the deck. This ancient dweller among cannibals, still erect, his head still carried proudly, but the flesh hanging loose and withered on his bones. It was easy to fancy the admiration he must have inspired forty years ago among the wild people in whose eyes physical strength and perfection were the great qualities of a man. In the cabin, while the cook squeezed limes for the first of many rum punches, Charlie took off his tunic of white dill, and as he sat there in his singlet, I saw that his arms and chest, like his face, were tanned to an incredible dull brown, and that patterns of tattooing ran from wrist to shoulder, greenish-blue and barbaric. I never learned his history. It must have been a thing to stir the imagination. Once, as we sat drinking, Tari mentioned Stevenson, and the old man's face brightened. Ye, he said slowly, in native fashion. I remember him well. He came to Hiva Ora with the casco. A funny fellow he was, thin. There was nothing to him but skin and bones, and questions he'd ask you a hundred in a minute. I didn't take to him at first, but he was all right. I didn't care how he dressed. One day I saw him walking on the beach with nothing on but a pair of drawers. The cook plied back and forth, removing empty glasses and bringing full ones. As each tray was set on the table, Peter, typical of a lively and garrulous old age, seized his glass and held it up. Hurrah, he explained. Down she goes, drawled Charlie, and Terry murmured, Cheerio! At the end of two hours, Charlie's eyes were beginning to glaze, and Peter was mumbling vaguely of the Esperanza. Terry rose and beckoned to me. Make yourselves at home, he said to the old man. I've got to go ashore. Akatora will give you lunch, whenever you want it. As our canoe made for the reef, my companion told me there was to be a feast in his honor, and that his wife wished me to be present. We shot into the passage without a wedding. The people crowded about Terry, laughing, shaking his hand, speaking all at once, an unmistakable warmth of welcome. The settlement reached by short, steep trail lies at the base of a break in the cliffs. At the door of her mother's house, Apicura Metis turned out, as becomes a supercargo's wife, in the choicest of trade finery. She wore heavy golden earrings, bands of gold were on her fingers, and her loose frock was of pale embroidered silk. Her mother, the keen-eyed old woman I had seen in the canoe, made me welcome. In the afternoon, when the feast was over and we rose stiffly, crammed with fish and taro and baked pig, I asked Terry if he knew a youngster who would show me the best path to the interior of the island. A boy of ten was soon at the door, a dark-skinned child with a great shock of hair and legs disfigured by scars of old coral cuts. A twisting path, cobbled and wide enough to walk two abreast, led us to the summit. 
the stones were worn smooth by the passage of bare feet for excepting fish all the food of the village is brought over this road from the plantations to the sea there could be no doubt that the ring of cliffs on which we stood was an ancient reef in places one could recognize the forms of coral embedded with shells of many varieties in the metamorphosed rock here and there one found pockets of a material resembling marble veined and crystalline formed from the coral by processes impossible to surmise the bulk of the rock is the fine-grained white limestone called makatera in the eastern pacific the level summit of the cliffs over which in centuries gone by the sea had washed and thundered forms a narrow path sparsely wooded and cultivated in spots where a thin soil has gathered in the hollows we halted under one of the palms crowning the inner brink the trail wound down giddily ahead so steep in places that ladders had been fastened to the rock to right and left of us the cliffs were sheer walls of limestone rising from a level little above that of the sea the low hills of the interior volcanic and firm covered draining in every direction toward the foot of the macaria have formed a circling belt of swamp land on which all the taro of the island was grown one could look down on the beds from where we stood a mosaic of pale green laid out by heathen engineers in days beyond the traditions of men another time perhaps i will tell you of that afternoon how we climbed down the trail and walked the dikes among the taro how my escort increased to a merry company as the people began to come after food for the evening meal of a boisterous swim in a pool beneath a waterfall of how i found the remains of an ancient house built of squared stone so long ago that over one end of it the wooded earth lay two yards deep toward evening in the bush at the edge of the taro swamps i came upon a large house built of bamboo and pandalus in the native fashion a man was standing framed in the doorway a tall white man dressed in pajamas of silk his gold-rimmed spectacles gray beard and expression of intelligent kindness were vaguely academic out of place as the cultivated voice which invited me to stop the boys and girls escorting me squatted on their heels outside a brace of pretty children shy and half-naked scurried past as i entered the house my host waved his hand toward a mat there was only one chair in the room standing before a table on which i saw a small typewriter and a distorted heap of manuscript otherwise the place was unfurnished except for books ranged in crude bookcases tier upon tier stacked here and there in precarious piles standing in rows along the floor i am glad to see you he said as he offered me a cigarette from a case of basket-work silver it is not often that a european passes my house i shall not give his name or attempt to disguise him with a fictitious one it is enough to say that he is one of the handful of real scholars who have devoted their lives to polynesian research i had read his books published long before and wondered more than once whether he still lived and where he hid himself the years of silence had been spent he told me in a comparative study of the ocean dialects through which he hoped to solve the riddle of the pacific to determine whence came the brown and straight-haired people of the islands now with the material in hand he had chosen ahu ahu as a place of solitude where he might complete his task of compilation undisturbed on the whole he said with agreeable readiness to speak of his work i am convinced that they came from the west the frenchman's theory that the race originated in new zealand like the belief that they migrated westward from the shores of america is more picturesque more stirring to the imagination but the evidence is too vague if one investigates the possibilities of an eastward migration on the other hand one finds everywhere in the western islands the traces of their passage far out in the orient in isolated groups of the coast of sumatra about java and the celebres in the arufa sea i can show you people of the true polynesian type even in such places where the last migration must have passed nearly two thousand years ago scraps of evidence remain a word a curious custom the manner of carrying a basket 
These things might seem coincidences if the trail did not grow warmer as one travels east. Though no trace of their blood is left, New Guinea must at one time have been a halting place in the migration. Papua, it is called, and one finds the word current in Polynesia, meaning a garden, a rich land. The natives of New Guinea are as unlike the people of the eastern Pacific, I should say, as the average American or Englishman, and yet, throughout New Guinea, there is a most curious cropping out of Polynesian words, pointing to a very ancient intercourse between the races. Consider the word for woman among the Polynesians. In Rarotonga, it is Vien. In Tahiti, Vahain. In Marquise, Vihin. In Hawaii, Vahaini. In Samoan, Vafain. The same root runs through the dialects of Papua. In Matu, Woman is Haibain, in Kaprokunu, Varbain, in Amorne, Barbain, and in Matagu, it is Va, which in this part of the Pacific means variously female, seed, and rain. I can cite you dozens of similar examples. Now and then one comes across something that sets one's imagination to work. As you must know, the word for sun in the islands is Ra. But in Tahiti they have another word, Mahana, in New Guinea, 3,500 miles away, and with all Melanesia between, the tribes of South Cape call the sun Mahana. What a puzzle it is! Though it may be the merest coincidences that Ra has a flavor of Egypt, I wonder if there could be a connection. I used to know a girl in Tahiti whose strange and rather beautiful name, hereditary as far back as the records of her family went, was that of a queen of Egypt, who ruled many hundreds of years before Christ. But I mustn't ride Mahabi too fast. It is a pity you can't stop on Ahu Ahu for a time. There are not many islands so unspoiled. I've grown very fond of the place. I doubt if I ever leave it permanently. If you are interested in ghosts, you had better change your mind. I have a fine collection here. The house is built on the site of a tumble-down mare. There is our white rooster, the spirit of an old chief, which appears during the new moon, perfectly harmless and friendly, but the people rather dread him. Then we have a ghostly pig, very bad indeed, and a pair of malignant women who walk about at night with arms and long hair entwined and are suspected of ghastly appetites. I shall not say whether or not I have seen any of these. Perhaps it is living too much alone, but I am not so skeptical as I was. It was not easy to part with such a host, but the sun was low over the Marica, and the prospect of crossing the dikes among the taro and scaling the cliff by dark drove me at last to take reluctant leave. Lamps were shining in the village when I returned. In some of the houses I heard the voice of the father reading aloud solemnly from the Bible in the native tongue. In others, the people were assembled to chant their savage and melancholy hymns. Tari was alone on the veranda, smoking in his absent-minded fashion, and motioned me to sit down beside him. I told him how I had spent the afternoon. When I had finished, he puffed on in silence for a time. "'It is a strange place, Ahu Ahu,' he said at last. "'My mother-in-law has finished her prayers, sung her hymnies, and put away the family Bible. Now she has gone to the house of one of her pals for a session with old Rakamona. Like the land itself, the people are relics of an elder time, pure heathen at heart. End of chapter 4